What do you desire? A map. <laughs> what do you desire? You know, as we get in this Christmas holiday shopping season, and we bombarded <laughs> by what Christmas message? You know, what are you going to buy? Bye -bye. What you, not maybe what you need, but what do you want? What do you desire? And it's out there for your taking, right? So today, we're finishing the series on Ten Commandments as we talk about covetousness. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or his Mustang that's parked out here. <laughs> or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we're just thankful for your word, your truth. <coughs> Lord, may it convict us. May it change us from the inside out. May it penetrate our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Covetedness. Now, if somebody here can say no to that, I want to, I want to meet them. Okay? <laughs> Ever long for something that is not yours. I think we all have, right? At some point or another. And if you're sitting there thinking, no, not really. What about Black Friday? What's the Black Friday all about? We just had it, right? It's trying to get us to go out and buy things that maybe we don't need. You know, and I get caught up in it too. It's like, but it's a great deal. It'd be nice to have. Do I need it? No. But it's a great deal. You know? And I grew up with my dad who experienced the depression. And um, he was a teenager going, when the Depression hit. And so he was always about getting those great deals. And it got entrenched in me, you know. And sometimes, and in the past, I have bought things that I did not need. But it was a great deal. And what happens? you got to tell everybody. Somebody told me, I, if I offend anybody here from Colorado Springs, I'm sorry. But somebody told me one time the difference between the people in Colorado Springs and the people in Pueblo, is that people in Pueblo are always looking to save, always looking for that deal. And the people in Colorado Springs are always bragging about how much they spent for something. And I'm like, and he was from Colorado Springs, and I'm like, really? That's interesting. You know, so we here in Pueblo are looking for those deals, right? You know, this is an interesting commandment. And it's interesting you put it at number 10. Okay, it's like number 10, top hit parade. But at number 10, because in a way it's almost, is it a catch-all? Is it re-summarizing? Because if we steal something right, we steal it because we covet it. We steal it because we want it. If we have an affair with somebody's wife or somebody else, it's because we covet the neighbor's wife, right? And, or was it just kind of a general law? Like I said, just kind of a catch-all here. Okay, you know, because covetousness covers a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, every day because of our selfish desires, we're struggling with that. And I was just joking about the Mustang, but you know, sometimes I'm like, yeah, that'd be kind of a fun car to have. And you know, the guy who works across the street, dentist office, parks it out here during the week, has a big for sale sign in it. And, but then I went to the leadership. They won't give me the money to buy it. Ah, I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was either that or the Porsche. But anyway, I tried to tell them the deal on the Mustang was much better. Wrong. But I, you know, I, I have to admit, in the past, there were times that I have coveted cars. I have wanted somebody else's vehicle. You know, I don't feel that way so much anymore, but there was a time that I did. When I was in the military, I remember whenever I got a promotion or got a pay raise, first thing I was thinking is, what can I buy? Yeah. And often I already walked in on something before even the pay raise started. You know? <laughs> what else can I get with that? Yeah. Pleasing. Pleasing. Where's that come from? Pleasing. In the Bible, if you, in the book of Genesis, Remember a woman named Eve? <laughs> they looked at the fruit on the tree 
and said it was pleasing to her eye. Pleasing. Did you know that same word is covet? Uh -oh. Same word translated is covet. It was used for pleasing. Do you have a consuming appetite that's just never satisfied? You know, I think it comes out of that void that if we don't have Jesus Christ, because I know for me, when I didn't have Jesus, I had that longing to keep trying to fill it with something. Mm -hmm. Keep trying to fill it and could never be satisfied. Mm -hmm. If I just buy this truck, mm -hmm. if I just get this big yeah. screen TV, you know, if I just get, then I'm going to be happy. And does it bring happiness? No. No, no sure it is. doesn't. No, it doesn't, does it? Sure it is, yes. Yeah. If we don't have Jesus... We're never going to feel, because, and we talked about it last night, Jesus puts that longing in our heart. God puts that longing in our heart for what? For Him. And that's the only way it can be filled. We try to fill it with other stuff. Yet people who do that are never satisfied. They're never content. First Timothy chapter 6, we're going to look at First Timothy today, where Paul's talking and he says, if anyone teaches false doctrines and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly, te uh, godly teaching, he is conceited and understands nothing. Mm. Okay, just stay with me and think, well, what's teaching false doctrine have to do with covetousness? He has an unhealthy interest in controversies, quarrels, about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. False teachers are teaching money. Mm -hmm. And I, I heard one time somebody told me a story that in China, in the registered churches, some people pursue being a preacher or a pastor for, because it's a job. And it, they get money. They get money. But they're false teachers. Mm -hmm. Greed versus godliness. And Paul is is, you know, Paul is teaching, Paul's discipling Tim, uh, Timothy, he's trying to help this brother, you know, and he's talking about these false teachers out there that are after greed, they're after to, for financial gain, and they're not really filled with the Spirit. They're not really after pleasing God, they don't have godliness, they just have greed, and they're polluting the gospel message. They're giving a false message for financial gain. And Paul's saying, if anyone here teaches false doctrines, what? He doesn't have understanding, right? But if there's godly teaching, then there is contentment and there is gain. Does not agree, conceited, and understands nothing. What's conceited about? Pride. Pride. And what's that about? Mm -hmm. yeah, right. yeah. And you know, unfortunately, some things in our world today have not changed. Uh -oh. Unfortunately, there are false prophets. There's false teachings out there. And we've got to pray to God and ask for wisdom. We've got to ask for discernment yes. to know what the truth is. We have to know his word. We have to study his word. We've got to pray. We've got to have the Holy Spirit so we can have that wisdom. We know the truth. And we know and recognize false teachings when they come. And if we just trust in ourselves, we're conceited. Right. And we understand that. Right? We have to be able... They, what they were doing was reject, rejecting the healthy doctrine which caused controversies, caused quarrels, called envy, strife, malicious talk. Does this sound good in a church? <laughs> Evil suspicions, friction, 
you know, we were singing a song about unity. We were talking last night in the Alpha Course about church and about unity. You think that's what Satan wants? No. This sounds like Satan's game plan right here. To cause strife within the church. You know, put in position those false teachers that cause controversies, quarrels, envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction. And Paul's pointing out three characteristics here of these false teachers. First of all, they have a corrupt mind, okay? They're, which means that they may be immoral. Their morals are not correct. They don't know the truth. Either they knew it and it was taken from them, or they've been deceived, or they, they're just, they don't recognize what the truth is. And a perverted concept of godliness meaning that they are teaching for the sole purpose of financial gain. Mm -hmm. Not to save souls, mm -hmm. but to make money. Mm -hmm. Godliness <laughs> was a way for them to make money. Okay. I'm not, I, I think there's people out there today doing the same thing. Right. That's why I say we've got to have discernment. We've got to have wisdom to know the false stuff. Paul goes on to say, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness and contentment. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. Have you ever seen a hearse pull up with a U-Haul truck at the graveside? I said, okay, he has all this stuff. We want to make sure it's at his graveside so he can take it with him, right? He acquired all this wealth, let him, you know, bury it with him. Yeah, they did to some extent, yeah, in the tombs. If we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. Be happy. Well, maybe Paul was. I don't know if we are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know, you know, when I was in school, we studied Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and they just always stuck with me. Because there's basic needs that we all have. Food, clothing, shelter. And we've got to meet those needs before we can go to the next level, Right? So those are basic needs that every human being is concerned about or needs. Okay. And there's people around the world that these needs are not met. That's right. They don't have food. They don't have clothing. They don't have shelter. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's people in Pueblo that are struggling with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and to many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into... Ruin. Destruction. And you know, and when they're the ones that you love, that's what makes it so difficult. Doesn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, the ones you care about the most and you see them down this path of ruin and destruction. Okay, here's one of the most misquoted verses probably in the Bible. For the root, for the love of money is a, a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Let's talk about this for a minute. Paul's talking about godliness with contentment. They go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. If we're godly, that void in us, the want and desire more, should be filled mm -hmm. by the Holy Spirit, by having Jesus Christ in our life. We should be content with what we have. But here Paul's not speaking so much about Christ. He's talking about essential needs. And Paul always, he didn't want to put a burden on the churches to, to provide for him. He was called what we call a tent maker. Okay, literally, he had a business of making tents to help support his ministry. Now, there were churches that helped support him, but he didn't want the church to be feel like they had to provide him a source of income or support. So he's talking about here, I'm content, he said, I got food, I got clothing. Okay, that's all I need. That's all I need. I can't, he can't take it with you. He had the essentials. He didn't want to ever get into the point where he was feeling greedy and in, in, in a desire to keep wanting more. 
He trusted in God. What's happening? Who's our provider? God. 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 Mm -hmm. huh? Not my parents? <laughs> Not my employer? <laughs> Not my best friend? Not the church? Not the government? God. He uses all those, but he's the provider. Amen. And if a door closes at one point, he you have faith he's going to open another. Because he's the provider. Right? Is there anything wrong with money? No. I mean, essentially, it's just a piece of paper, right? Unless you idolize it. Yeah. yeah. So those who want to get rich, okay, that's one phrase, the love. See, this is where one of the ways this is misquoted. It's not money. It's the love. Yeah. It's that pursuit of always trying to make more money. Or that greed within us to, to want to pursue and keep it never enough, never enough, never enough. How, no matter how much money you make, it's never enough. It's never enough. But, and there are people that are eager to make more money, to get more money. And that's what it's about. It's the love of money. It's not money. It's the love of money. You know, when Jesus, when the rich man wanted to follow Jesus, what did he tell him? Go sell everything. And what did he do? Yeah, he went away and he was sad. It's like, everything? <laughs> Everything, you know, what about plan B? What if it doesn't work out with Jesus? Well, I can come back to it. You know? And, you know, I think often, you know, if we're really following Jesus, there is no plan B. Help us. Grimple Creek's plan B. I don't know about that. What about want. Understand there's a difference between want and need. Want, desire, greed, never having enough, never having enough, always desiring, always longing for more stuff, more money. Okay? Eager for money. And what happens when we're eager for money? We wander from the faith. You're eager and you're. Because what happens? Wait a minute. Is your focus still on God? Yeah. Or is it on money? Okay. And whatever we're focused on, that's the direction we're going to go. Okay. It's just like if I want to take a picture of Mario here, but I'm looking at new. Am I going to get a picture of Mario? <laughs> no, you might. Maybe Mario's godliness and it's money, you know? <laughs> I'm going to head towards that. So it's what, where's your focus? What are you looking at? You're going to God <laughs> godliness and faith versus evil motivation and unbelief. Okay? Which way? Which direction are you headed? <coughs> because with godliness, we have <coughs> faith that God will provide. Yes. If we don't have faith, then we may pursue. Our motivations may change. Our desires change. And we may be going down the wrong path. Paul's concern here was about the false doctrine and the sinful character of the, of the teachers, of the religious teachers and what they were teaching. And the connection between <laughs> their sinful behavior, their false doctrine, and what they're telling others. Mm -hmm. Timothy's concern was, first of all, there's no edification. Right. How's God being glorified? Through <coughs> this. He's not. God is not being edified. And it was creating all kinds of controversy, right? Within the church, within the body, for financial gain and sexual conquest. Yeah, financial gain and sexual conquest. Because leaders have power, right? To influence others. And they used religion as a cover for deceit, 
to mislead people, <coughs> for evil, evil motives. Does that make sense to anybody? Godliness is a means to financial gain. Mm -hmm. Godly, I mean, how do we relate that? I mean, that's what Paul's saying. Godliness is a means to financial gain. Godliness with contentment is great. Mm -hmm. If we are godly and we are following God and we're doing what he wants us to do, he will provide. Amen. Mm -hmm. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to focus on the money. He will meet our needs. And we should, if we are godly, we should be content. Yes, we should be. Yeah. Help us, Lord. And that is religion and a practice that goes hand in hand. Back to the love of money. And it says love of money is a root of all kinds of of evil. Take note, it's not the root. The love of money is not the only root to evil. Mm. It is a root. Okay. People that are eager for money again wander from the faith. Have you ever seen that? Have you ever known people eager for money that have wandered? That's mm -hmm. yeah, amazing. <laughs> 2,000 years ago, things that were going on still go on today. Yep. You know, still going on. Mm -hmm. And I have a theory about that. About, you know, from Satan's standpoint, if it works, why change it? Right. <laughs> <laughs> really? Makes sense. Yeah. Deceitful hearts, love of money, lust, and then shit, right? And this happens to religious leaders today. Mm-hmm who may enter the ministry with the wrong kind of heart, may have deceitful hearts, may have a love of money and a way to, to make money, have lust, and then the ministry is shipwrecked. It falls apart because God's not at the heart of it. God's not at the center. This morning, um, talking about Pastors who start churches and so forth and may be on their hands and knees, totally dependent on the Lord to bring the people, to bring the resources. And then as the church grows and develops, not so dependent mm -hmm. on the Lord. And no, there's not evil necessarily in their hearts, but they start becoming deceived. And it's easy to do to think that they may be doing it because of their preaching, because of their worship. Because of their programs mm. is what's bringing people to the church. And begin to th forget about God mm -hmm. and His work. And what happens? Division, controversies, quarrel, adultery can happen, and just tear the church apart. And I listened to the pastor told that story one time. And he was involved in the center. Because, and he admits, because I stopped going to God, I stopped being dependent on Him. And then that's when all, and then the evil starts coming in and starts dividing the church. He was deceived. And I don't think he so much had the love of money, but he was deceived. <coughs> Keep your checkbook in balance. Because not many people, I don't know how many people have checkbooks anymore. <laughs> you know, but I'm not just talking about your checkbook here. You know, sometimes we feel like we're walking on eggshells around other people. We, we may, whether we're people pleasers or not, but we don't want to offend maybe somebody else. Mm -hmm. Which in and of itself is a good thing. But we've got to be careful that we don't mute the truth. Okay? We talked about do not lie, okay? and we talked about white lies. But we also, in a body of Christ, where we love one another, we have to speak the truth, but we have to speak it in love. You know, we don't just tell people what's on our mind. But if we do have an issue with somebody else, we bring it up and we speak it in love. 
and we try and get it resolved, okay? We don't let it linger. We don't let Satan come in and use this as a dividing issue that starts quarrels or controversies within the church. But on the other hand, we can't speak out with evil motives. And we can't, you know, how often is what we see wrong with somebody else is the same thing that's wrong with us, huh. you know? And, and we don't like the other person because they're just like us, you know, whatever they act. Okay, so I'm not saying that you just go and you tell people what you think of them, <laughs> okay? But be careful that we don't have things buried down and hidden. And so this is what I'm talking about, it's a balancing act, okay? We are the checkbook. We gotta keep ourselves in balance, okay? And, and those are issues that we can pray about, that we can seek God on and say, God, I feel like I'm supposed to tell this person something, but I don't know how to do it, or what should I say? And God will give you the words, and, and as long as it's done in love, you know, or you take somebody else with the church, with you. But too often what happens is people get offended in the church, and nobody knows they're offended, or nobody knows why they're offended. Mm -hmm. Or the person who offended them doesn't know. Something they said, something they did. And we gotta, we gotta bring those things to the light. We gotta bring them out in the open. We've gotta deal with them because we're all human. And I know I've said things to people that offended them that I didn't even know. And it wasn't something that I spoke an evil motive or desire. And I didn't even know it offended them. And so, as a body, and when we talk about unity, these are the things that we have to we have to work through. And that's God's body. So Satan can't use them to divide us. Right? We are the witnesses of truth. We're the witnesses of Jesus Christ himself. And we can't take on, if there's act, we don't want to accuse anybody else. And we've got to be careful that we don't take on an offense that's not ours also. This is why we pray for discernment. This is why we seek discernment. This is why we seek wisdom from God. <clears throat> seek and then you will find. What is this the lifestyle anymore? You know, back in Paul's day, food and clothing for him was adequate. You know, a simple run, one room home would have been adequate for most, probably. Today, it's much more complicated than that, right? I have to be careful, because we love to watch HGTV, Home and Garden, right? Yes. And they're doing all these renovations, and then we're looking around the house, wow, wouldn't it be great to have granite countertops? Oh my God, you know, these women walk in this house. Oh, well, I have to have granite countertops. I have to have stainless steel appliances. I have to have, you know. And, and then it starts influencing my thinking as I'm looking around our kitchen, you know? And, there's, and then the fireplace, an old fireplace like ours, I said, oh, that has to be tiled over. That has to be, you know, redone or whatever because it's out of date. You know? So all these influences, we've got to be careful of. I mean, they seem innocent enough. But, you know, what, what's our desires? What's our needs and what's our wants? And this is not a bad thing to do. Just take a sheet of paper. Put down one side needs, put down the other side wants. What are the things that you need? Okay? Food, clothing, shelter, probably transportation. You know, what are those things you need? And what are those things that you want? And start, you know, not that the wants are a bad thing. Well, pray about those and submit them to God. Maybe God wants you to have those. Maybe he doesn't, you know? We've had known people that prayed that, you know, talking about giving up everything, God told them, you know, through prayer that you need some new clothes, you know? You, your clothes are all worn out. And basically it's encouraging them to go out and buy new clothes, you know? So you don't know unless you submit it to God. What are your needs and what are your wants? Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, I am not saying this because I am in need. 
for I am content. Whatever the circumstances, whatever the circumstances, could you be content living in the Middle East? Could you be content if you were in prison? Could you be content if you had to move in with a relative? You know, what is the contentment about? Is the contentment in God or is it in your surroundings? You know, how are you content? You know? Whatever the circumstances, can you follow that? Can you be content in whatever the circumstances? And I know, um, yeah, I don't know if it's related. But it's just that the thought that came to my mind was when we had our accident in Taiwan and our car was parked and the guy hit it on the scooter and he ended up dying. And, you know, if I couldn't give it up to God, there's no way I could have peace. There's no way I could have be content. Because it would just eat away. Are they going to kick me out of the country? Are they going to kick us out of the country? Are they going to put us in jail? You know, because we parked our car and it was the guy that hit it, died. You know, what are they going to do to us? And I had to find the peace in Jesus. And as soon as I gave it up and was willing to surrender to whatever happens, it's okay. And then God gave me his peace. And it all turned out okay. But the worries and the concerns can overcome you. The fear can overcome you. And that's what <clears throat> Satan wants. But if you submit it to the Lord, mm -hmm. he will take it away and give you contentment, will give you peace. Yes. And he did. Amen. And we had to go through six months of arbitration hearings and final court appearance, but it all came out fine. You know, they found us, we had no fault, which is very unusual in that culture, because if you're alive, you're partially at fault. Because <laughs> if I wasn't alive, we wouldn't have had the car, and the car wouldn't have been parked there. That's, that's the rationalization. Mm -hmm. And so when you, if you're in America and that would happen, you think, okay, oh, you know, I'm fine. But if you're in a foreign country, you don't know, you know how they're going to treat you. So we found contentment. We found peace. Where? It's the only place. That's it. There is no other place to find peace. That's the only place. It's the only place that boy can be filled. That's the only place where we'll find peace in our hearts. It's the only place that we're going to be content is by having him in us. I'm sorry, I'm going to go back because this goes too fast. I want you to have a chance to read this. certain hope, perfect charity, insight, wisdom, discernment. Ask and it'll be given. See? We'll find. I ask you for forgiveness for not always having that accepting life. That when life had brought me in accordance with your desires, I was angry and rebelled. And I We've all been there. Mm -hmm. I do not desire to be like this anymore. I ask for your help. Forgive me for taking you for granted. Forgive me for trying to do it on my own. Forgive me. Mind is playing 
if we still, are we sitting there and still feel there's a, uh, we don't, we're not at peace. Okay? Our soul's not at peace. Then there may be something, an area where maybe we have not surrendered to God. Maybe there's an area that we're still holding on to. Maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe it's judgment. Maybe it's something else. But I ask you to pray to God. If you're not at peace, to have him reveal to you what it is that is keeping you from being at peace, to keep you from being content in him, to having the joy of Christ with you. Because unless you can get to that point of peace and being content, then you're going to continue to be in turmoil. And that is not what God wants for us. He wants us to be at peace. He wants us to be at rest in Him. And the only way is to completely surrender to Him in all areas of our life. You know, Mario said being a slave, and we don't like the word slave. We don't even like the word servant in our culture. You know, we don't want to serve anybody. We don't want to be a slave to anybody. But unless you're willing to do that for Jesus, you're never going to be at peace. Let us pray. Lord, we're just so thankful for your word. We're thankful that we can study it. We can worship freely. We can come here and share how great you are with one another without the fear of persecution. Lord, I pray right now for each and every person here today that they will find the peace in you. And if they can't, Lord, that you will reveal it in their hearts the, with their issues or things that they need to deal with so that they can be at peace. You, because there's no greater feeling than to experience your peace, your love, your joy that you want us all to have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.